What is sin? Perhaps you've heard people talk about sin or have even heard preachers preach against sin. Perhaps you have some knowledge or idea concerning what sin is and could even name some sins discussed in the Bible. But perhaps you don't fully understand the concept of sin. In this lesson, I want you to become acquainted with some fo- some of the Bible's teachings concerning sin, understanding what sin is and understanding what sin does. In addition, I want you to make two determinations concerning sin. First, the determination to stay away from sin in the future. And second, the determination to seek the forgiveness of your past sins. As we endeavor to learn the right answers to life's most essential questions, we must ask ourselves, what is sin? Of all of the diseases and illnesses that have plagued mankind throughout history, you think about leprosy and cancer and smallpox and tuberculosis and HIV and Ebola and the bubonic plague and all of these things. There's nothing that has been so widespread or so deadly as sin. So having an accurate understanding of the nature and consequences of sin is essential if we desire to live our lives in a way that glorifies God. In addition, A proper understanding of sin is also essential if we want to learn about God's plan for saving mankind from his sin, which we'll focus on in the next couple of lessons. So let's begin, and we want to talk about the introduction of sin to the world. As we see that God did not create man in sin, you know, if we're going to develop an accurate understanding of sin, we need to go back to the beginning, to the creation of man and to the Garden of Eden. God created man in his own image. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This passage that details God's creation of man indicates that man has been created with a soul, that he is a spiritual being created in the image of God, as we discussed in lesson number two. Furthermore, after God had completed his creation, he looked at his creation, which he had made and declared in verse 31, that it was very good. The obvious question then is, How could a holy God create man in sin and then declare that his creation was very good? Quite simply, he could not and he did not. Genesis 2 goes on to discuss the home that God gave to the man he had created, the Garden of Eden, a true paradise. In this place, Man had direct access to and a special relationship with God, his creator. At this point, man was entirely sinless. In this home, man was given one law to abide by. He was instructed not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is recorded in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. This law and its consequence was not too difficult for man to understand. In fact, when the woman was tempted by the devil, she was able to discern the difference between what the devil was saying to her and what God had said to her. And we'll notice Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 in just a little while. While it's doubtful that she fully understood what death was, since death had never yet occurred on the earth, she did understand that God had promised death as the consequence for breaking the law. In this we see that God gave man free will. God created man in such a way that he could choose either to follow God by keeping his law or 
choose another path by disobeying God's law. God did not force obedience upon man. Then we see that Satan tempted Eve. The temptation account is recorded in Genesis chapter 3 and verses 1 through 5. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In this passage, Satan, as he's using the serpent, lies to Eve concerning the consequence that God had stated and makes eating the forbidden fruit seem appealing. Notice that he first tells her that God didn't really mean what he said about death, saying, you will not surely die. Then notice what he adds to this lie, and this is paraphrased. Basically saying to Eve, well, God just knows that if you eat of this tree, that you'll become like him, and he doesn't want that to happen. So in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, we see that Eve chose to give in to the temptation and gratify her own lust, thus disobeying the law of God. The passage says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Notice how she looked at the tree differently now. She had believed the lies of the devil, and consequently, she ate of the tree. And when she did this, she sinned against God. She then proceeded to give some of the fruit to her husband, who also sinned when he ate. So then we need to ask the question, well, was God bluffing? Was God bluffing whenever he stated the consequence for sinning against him? Absolutely not. You could go into Genesis chapter 3 and read verses 14 through 24 as it records the punishments which God gave to Adam and Eve due to their disobedience. Included within these punishments are the punishments of being driven out of the Garden of Eden and being separated from the tree of life. You could look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse 24 to see that. Thus they would experience physical death in the future. The punishments that are described also go beyond physical punishments as their relationship with God changed. They were separated from the sort of relationship they had enjoyed with God prior to their sin while they were in the Garden of Eden. The separation from God was the worst punishment of all. This was the spiritual death that occurred on that very day they ate of the forbidden fruit. The physical death didn't happen until later. So the sin of Adam and Eve, with that sin, sin entered the world and has been here ever since. As we could continue to study, as we study the subject of sin, we can learn a great deal from this first recorded temptation and sin. As our temptations and sins still occur in the same basic way, though a serpent won't talk with us, and we likely won't be tempted to eat of any forbidden fruit, we still learn a great deal because sin and temptation still works in the same way. You notice then what sin is. As we come to this point after learning about the temptation and sin in the Garden of Eden, what is sin? Well, let's think about the definition of the Greek word that is translated sin in the New Testament. It's, trans, it's defined by Thayer in his Greek definitions as to miss the mark, to err, to be mistaken, to miss or wander from the path of uprightness and honor, to do or go wrong. 
This Greek word, then, it contains the idea of an archer who misses his target, and that's exactly what sin is. God has set a particular target for our lives, for our conduct, for our words, for our attitudes, for our thoughts, and everything about our lives. He set a target for our lives. Whenever we sin, we miss the target he has intended for us to hit. But as we'll talk about later in our study, there's a very high price to pay for missing God's mark in our lives. Remember from lesson one that God is a perfectly holy God. And if we want to be in fellowship with him and be at peace with him, we also must be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. 1 John chapter 1 verses 5 through 7 states, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So missing the mark, sinning, Missing this mark that God has set for our lives is extremely consequential in that it goes against the ways of our holy God. So when we think about what sin is, you know, the Bible also defines it for us. We don't have to be a Greek scholar to look into the Greek word we've just considered. The Bible defines it for us. God tells us exactly what sin is. He tells us that sin is the transgression of his law. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 defines sin as lawlessness. The text says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So sin is acting against or contrary to the law. It's violating the law. You know, some examples would help to make that clear. Adam and Eve, for instance, were instructed not to eat of the tree, not even to touch it. And they violated the law of God. They sinned whenever they did what they were instructed not to do. They missed the mark. Whenever an individual commits murder, he or she sins because God has given a law that forbids murder. Whenever one has sexual relations with someone other than his or her spouse, he or she sins because God has given a law regulating sexual relations, that they're only to be had within the confines of a scriptural marriage. When an individual hates his or her enemy, he or she sins because God has given a command to love one's enemy. Other verses could also help us to see that sin is a transgression of God's law. First John chapter 5 and verse 17 teaches us that all unrighteousness is sin. Thus, everything that is outside of God's standard of right is sin. Remember that he is entirely righteous, so also his laws are entirely righteous. Furthermore, James 4 verse 17 teaches that failing to do what, what, what is right, failing to do the right thing is sin. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. We might, as we try to think about sin and gain an understanding of what sin is, we might think about sin in two categories, just to help us better understand it. Now, as we briefly consider these two kinds of sin, please don't think that one kind is more dangerous than another, as all sin is equal in the sight of God. Also, please understand the Bible does not identify some sins as commission and some sins as omission. These are simply terms that I'm suggesting to you that that are helpful as we think about these areas of sin that we must avoid. First, let's talk about sins of commission. Sometimes God tells us not to do something. Sins of commission then occur whenever we do what God has said we must not do. Again, a sin of commission would be would occur whenever we do what God has said we must not do. So sins of commission would include things like committing fornication, 
lying, stealing, coveting, gossiping, using profanity, and all these sorts of things. These are all things God has told us not to do. So if we go ahead and do them, we commit sin. Next, you think about sins of omission. Sometimes God has told us to do certain things. Sins of omission would occur whenever we fail to do what we must do. So sins of omission would include things like failing to preach the gospel to others, failing to do good to those we have opportunity to help, failing to pray for our enemies, failing to love our spouses and our children in the way God has prescribed and such things. These are all things God has told us to do. And if we refuse or fail to do them, we commit sin. Now, you think about some examples of sin, and I know of no single Bible passage where it lists every sin that can possibly be committed. However, there are some non-exhaustive lists of sin, and I would recommend these to you, and, and we'll go through and we'll read these, but I'd encourage you to go back and seriously consider each one of these things mentioned in these passages, and then consider whether you're involved in any of these, and keep searching the Scriptures to see what else the Scriptures teach us concerning sin, and what other things we could add to the list that we're seeing here in just these three passages, because we don't want sin in our lives, as we'll see here in just a little while. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 now, in verses 9 through 11. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And then look with me in Romans chapter 1 in verses 28 through 32. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Again, as we think about these passages, please understand that sin is not limited to these lists. However, these passages will help you understand many of the th things that are sinful, mostly we think about those and think about the things that we've already said. Mostly these are things that could be classified as sins of commission. Now, let's think about as we answer the question, what is sin? Let's think about sins of 
devastating effects. We know that all men continue to sin. Sin did not stop with Adam and Eve. Cain chose to sin whenever he murdered his brother Abel. Throughout the Old Testament, you can read about folks who chose to sin against God, committing idolatry and murder and adultery and homosexuality and many things. In the New Testament, you continue to read about more of the same. Folks who chose to sin against God by lying and covetousness and fornication and such things. But sin hasn't stopped there. Men and women continue to sin today. Satan continues to try to destroy individuals today. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He continues to tempt us through our own lust, that is, through our own carnal desires. Satan tempts us to fulfill these desires in unlawful ways, according to James 1, 13 through 15. Romans 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Certainly, the Bible teaches that all sin. However, do you inherit your sin or sinful nature from Adam or from your parents? Many religious organizations teach the doctrine of inherited sin as a part of their doctrine. But I want to quickly help you to see that this doctrine is not Bible doctrine. While this subject is certainly too exhaustive, too, uh, too extensive to enter into a detailed explanation and refutation of the doctrine here, please do consider the following passages. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, it shows individual responsibility for sin, and it directly contradicts the idea that we can inherit sin from those who have lived before us. It says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Second, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4, it demonstrates the purity of children. Contrary to children who would be sinners, the purity of children. In this passage, Jesus instructed individuals to be converted and become like little children. Now you think about that. If children were condemned sinners due to the sin they had inherited, why would Jesus want us to become like them? Romans 5 and at verse 12 says that death spread through sin because all sinned not because sin was inherited. The larger passage, Romans 5, verses 12 through 21, is used by many to support the doctrine of inherited sin. However, realize that whatever this passage teaches, and it doesn't teach inherited sin, but whatever this passage teaches must be understood by what is said in verse 12, that death spreads to all men because all sinned, not because we have inherited sin. The bottom line is that each one is responsible for his or her own sin. We are born sinless. However, we reach a point of accountability whenever we know right and wrong and choose to do that which is wrong. All who have reached this point of personal accountability have decided to sin, Romans 3, verse 23, except Jesus Christ, Hebrews 4, and at verse 15 tells us. But why is this decision to commit sin so devastating? You know, all of, this, all of our study up to this point has been primarily about gaining an understanding of what sin is. Yet we have not really considered why it is so bad. At the beginning of the lesson, I mentioned that sin is the worst disease that mankind has ever known. Now, let me begin to help you understand the reasons why this is so true. Let's think about some physical consequences of sin. There are many devastating effects of sin. Some of the devastating effects of sin are physical in nature. In fact, all of the horrible things about this world have direct ties to sin. Certainly, this is not the way in which God has designed the world. 
Yet because of sin, this is the sad condition of the world. Sin has physical consequences for those who commit sin. For instance, committing some sins lead to jail time. Some sins can result in disease and health problems and losing your job and having your trust broken with your family members and your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers and and so forth. Sin can ruin your reputation and bring a bad name on your family. Sin can destroy relationships and deep, deeply hurt those you love the most. These are just some of the devastating physical consequences that are associated with sin. And certainly these physical consequences are devastating. However, they pale in comparison to the spiritual consequences of sin. These spiritual consequences are far more devastating than the physical ones. Romans 6 and verse 23 and James 1 verses 14 and 15 demonstrate that death is the consequence of sin. Romans 6 and verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. James 1 verses 14 and 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. These passages are in reference to spiritual death. For even those who have not sinned can die physically, but spiritual death is reserved only for sinners and is far worse than physical death. Death simply refers to a separation. Physical death is a separation between body and spirit. James 2 verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Spiritual death also is a separation. It's a separation from God. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 demonstrates that sin separates the sinner from God. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So when we sin, we separate ourselves from fellowship with God and from the spiritual blessings which come from Him. This is exactly the kind of death that Adam and Eve experienced in the day that they ate of the forbidden fruit. They were separated from the fellowship they had once enjoyed with God in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, the Scriptures talk about the condition of one who lives in pleasure being dead while she lives, 1 Timothy 5 and at verse 6. So even though you are physically living right now, you could be dead, and you are dead if you are still living in your sins, or you have never obeyed the Lord, as we'll talk about in lesson number 6. If you die physically while you are still living in your sins, you will experience eternal spiritual death. Eternal spiritual death is eternal separation from from God. It's called the second death in Revelation 21 and verse 8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 9, especially verse 9, shows that eternal punishment in hell will be away from God. That is, will be eternally separated from him. Read it with me. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from or away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Those who die in their sins then will experience the everlasting torment in the place of eternal separation from God in hell. We saw how the scriptures describe this place in lesson two of our study. Matthew 25 and verse 41, Matthew 25 verse 46, Mark 9 verses 43 and 44, Revelation 21 verse 8. They all describe hell as being a place of eternal fire, of extreme anguish, and a place that is prepared for the devil and his angels.
Now, if, as we realize all of this that we've talked about in trying to understand what sin is, let's talk about the problem of sin. We deserve spiritual death since we have chosen to violate God's law. When we sin, we separate ourselves from a holy God. We've seen the passages, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7. Thus, it is not God who leaves us. Rather, it is we who leave God. We leave His ways of holiness and righteousness. We leave God in pursuit of selfish ambitions or desires whenever we sin, demonstrating that we would rather fulfill our own fleshly desires rather than be in fellowship with Him and receive the blessings that come through Him. Then once we've sinned, even just one time, we deserve spiritual death, the consequences we've talked about already. Romans 6 and verse 23 describes the punishment of spiritual death as being our wages for sin. For example, when you are hired for a job, you agree to work. You agree to a particular wage in exchange for a certain amount of work. Whenever you complete that work, you receive the wage. It's what you deserve. In the same way, sin pays a particular wage. The wages of sin is death. This is what you deserve for sinning against God. And when you understand that sin produces this devastating physical consequence, you should desire justification. You should ask yourself, how can I be justified? Then you'll have to come to a very real but sad understanding. I can do nothing to justify myself. That is, I can do nothing to make myself just if I'd never sinned. In fact, even if you never sinned again, you could not remove the consequences or stains of your past sins. Additionally, there is no good deed that you could ever do to cleanse yourself from your sins. Therefore, you'd be hopelessly lost, lost and in need of a Savior. If you are in your sins, you do not deserve to be saved. You deserve to be eternally punished. That's what we read in Romans 6 and verse 23. Again, you would be hopelessly lost in your sins if you had nothing else to provide you with hope. As we close this study, trying to find the answer to what is sin, sin is a devastating problem for mankind. It is far greater than any other problem we could ever have. This is a problem that deals with the soul and that will condemn our souls to an eternal punishment in hell. Yet there is an answer. The answer or remedy to the problem of sin is also found in Romans 6 and verse 23. Notice the text again. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. We'll, just, we'll, we'll study about him and what God has accomplished through him in the next lesson. Then, we'll discuss what God requires us to do in order to be saved in the following lesson, in lesson number six. So what should you take away from this study? First, you should take an understanding of sin's entrance into the world. Second, you should take an understanding of what sin is. Third, you should take an understanding of what sin does. And fourth, you should desire, you should take a desire to discover the answer to man's greatest problems, as we'll discuss in the next couple of lessons.